It's the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Before we get into this episode, if you haven't already, please subscribe and leave us a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening to this on. This will help us reach more people and also help us to move up in the ranking. So thank you in advance for supporting us in that way. Also, if you want to join the Bread Real Estate Investing Community, you can get started in your first week for just $1. If you're interested, click the link in the show notes below or go to blackrealestatedialogue.com. Very excited for this episode today. Here I have a alum of the podcast, episode right. 14 guest, Deandra McDonald. Deandra, thank you so much for joining the show again. Absolutely. And I'm excited to be back. I think it was December 2019. Yeah. Maybe yep. like so exactly. almost two years ago. That's pretty crazy. Definitely. Definitely. You know, of course, we've definitely been in touch, but I'm excited uh, for everyone to know what you've been up to. Um, and if you haven't listened to episode 14, I definitely encourage you to go back and listen to it. Um, but Deandra, for those who um, don't know, or maybe they haven't heard your previous episode, uh, could you just share with the people um, who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name is DeAndre McDonald. I am a full-time real estate investor. Uh, I think uh, Sam and I got connected because he saw the story that I was a teacher prior to leaving the classroom and becoming a full-time investor. And I was just like slowly working at that point. So in 2019, I would have had like 13, 14 units, maybe somewhere around there. And now I'm at 30. And Sam at that point was like, 600 followers, 610 followers. And now he's at almost 70,000. Or did you cross 70,000? So yeah, close to there. Like (laughs) a hundred times greater than it was (laughs) in December, 2019, which is pretty insane. But yeah, that's me in a nutshell, an investor just out here trying to make it work and show you guys what the day-to-day life looks like of property management. Definitely, definitely. Um, and then you're in the you're in the Virginia market. Yes. For those who don't know. So the majority of my properties or the majority of my long-term rentals are currently in Virginia. Um, I have investments in two other states that do stuff, you know, that I don't necessarily manage myself um, because they're too far away. But yeah, the most uh, the bulk of my portfolio is in central Virginia. Definitely. Um, again, for those who who maybe are not as familiar with your story, if you give like a quick overview just of your journey in real estate. Um, of course, I know you started with house hacking, but can you give, I guess, like a cliff notes of, of your journey and, and how you've been able to get to where you are now? Absolutely. In 2013, I graduated from UVA with a degree in chemistry and realized very quickly that it wasn't going to get me very much money, right? Bachelors in science and the sciences are like high school diplomas. You definitely need to have a master's or a PhD if you want to make any real money. But I took me about six or seven months to land my first in-field job making $20,000 a year and really struggled for those first six months. Couldn't, didn't have enough to make ends meet or was barely keeping it together. I was too ashamed to go home. And when I finally got that first job, uh, realized that this couldn't be it. You know, this couldn't be the, the, the 40 year grind our parents had told us about in order to get the Rolex and the pension at the very end of your career because it was just too hard. And I was barely taking care of myself and my dog. Definitely knew that I couldn't have kids. I didn't even really feel comfortable attaching myself to somebody else because I didn't find myself financially stable. And the way I fell into real estate was when I went through my budget, I realized that my largest expense was housing. And you can only go so small, right? There's only, especially depending on where you live, there's only so cheap you can go if you are renting from somebody else um, without, at least for me, losing my sense of self, right? I wasn't willing to share a room with six other people. Um, But even the cheapest solo apartment I could come across was still my highest expense. And I thought to myself, like, well, what if I bought the house? You know, what if I could buy the through two or three bedroom home, rent out the other rooms, that could decrease my um, expense, that could bring it down and I can maybe sleep in the basement or I can make my life uncomfortable knowing I'm doing it for free, yes. And that's how I kind of got started. It was really because I had no money and had to get creative because I couldn't give back the degree. You know, I couldn't sell the car 
partly because I owed more on it at that point than it was worth. Because when you buy, you put all those financing fees in that loan. Um, I didn't have the cash to pay off the credit cards. So housing was the only thing that felt in my control or possible. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, I think for so many people, it's, it's that moment that kind of gets them going. Um, yeah. you, know, you and other guests we've had, it's like, wait, I'm spending all this, this money on renting where I'm living at, there has to be another way. And um, for a lot of people, um, it's house hacking. So um, what, is, what are some misconceptions you've come across, um, you know, people who've taken your courses, people who you've done coaching with as it relates to house hacking um, that you've had, you feel like you've had to um, dispel? Number one, that house hacking is permanent. I think that that is something that people have in their minds. Like if I'm going to buy this house to house hack, the whole time I'm living here, I have to house hack. And the answer is no. House hacking can be for a period of time when you first buy the property. It could be, hey, you've been in this property 10 years and now you need a little extra money. Um, I My very first house, I house hacked immediately. And then I bought a house with my now husband and we decided to house hack because we wanted to pay for our wedding. So we lived together, we lived in the basement in our master ensuite, and we had someone upstairs and that income, because we could afford the house on our own, that income paid for our wedding. And we got married in December and in January, we were like, here's your notice, Brett. Thank you very much, we appreciate your time. Because it wasn't supposed to be a long-term commitment. It was like, yeah. I have a plan in mind. I'm gonna sacrifice or I'm going to adjust because I try to stay with North sacrifice. I'm gonna adjust for right now but then I'm going to change in the future. And now I could live here by myself or well, my husband and I could live here if we want. We can move out completely and rent it out, but it's not forever. Like having a goal in mind, people sometimes, when I say I need you to change your lifestyle, think of sacrifice, right? Think of, well, I never get to have this now because and it's like, no, just for these six months or just for these two years so we can get this other piece under control. Um, the other piece about house hacking is that it's somehow unethical or it's somehow scammy. And I, I, that I can't understand. I can't, like, I just don't understand this idea of I have something and the market rate for this is less than what I'm paying. And I'm offering that to you. And I, especially when I got on TikTok, that was a very big thing or opinion was this is somehow a scam, you know? Um, and it's not. And the biggest reason it's not is because I take on all the risk, mm -hmm. you know? So if the mortgage is 500 and you're paying me 500, you're like, well, you're looking for free. It's like, yeah, but I'm also responsible if the roof collapses. I'm also responsible if this AC goes out, that the electric stays on, that the water keeps flowing. Like I'm responsible for if things go wrong, I'm not looking to you. Because if you want to split expenses equally, and we can split expenses equally, <laughs> but I don't think that's actually what you guys want. So those would be my two biggest, that it's not a forever commitment and that it is totally fine to rent out some of your space the same way you might rent a car or rent your tools to somebody for a while or equipment. It's the same thing. Definitely. So how, how was COVID for you? You know, a lot of people... There's, there's tons of stories, right? We've had right. people say tons of things and, and how it went for them with their investments and stuff. But how was it for you? You know, it wasn't bad at first. And I think you could even see it in my videos yep. until uh, COVID was March of 2020. It's kind of when things shut down and we could feel the effects. And I didn't really feel the effects until April, 2021. So it took a long time for it to start trickling down to me because I think they those stimulus checks helped uh employment kind of came unemployment excuse me kind of got released pretty quickly and where it started getting a little bad for me was when unemployment started to get pulled back and then when I don't know I I, I can't even say why all of a sudden it, it, it like it took so long to hit because I really assumed it was going to hit sooner but it started probably in May, I had my first just active non-payment. And I want, let me back up. I like to tell people on my TikTok, this is non-messy. 
So if you hear from messy TikTok, go somewhere else. We are a teaching platform. And I think you're the same way, right? This is a yeah. teaching moment. We're not here to just be like, tenants suck. Da, 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 da. So I had my first active, I'm just not paying in May of 2021. And as a refresher, I have 30 units and my first non-pay for, for 12 months with 30 people was one tenant in May. And that was also the first tenant who refused assistance, like didn't want to fill out the paperwork, didn't want me to bug her, kind of just disappeared off the map. And that kind of started the chain a little bit of, I think, in that community that I had. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't been the worst. You know, I once I realized people were going to try to apply for rent relief and that was going to happen in mass, I really tried to set up a system at my complex about, hey, this is how we fill out stuff. This is how we submit it. Let me be in control of this. I got the paperwork. I know what needs to be printed, what needs to be scanned. And that's sped it up. And like this morning, actually, I got my first, hey, we've approved it. They paid all her back rent. They're paying wow. three months in advance. Um, and it'll come in the mail at some point. I think they're, because they didn't do direct deposits. So I think at some point it'll show up in my PO box. But it took from application to probably receipt took about two months, which is mm -hmm. not the worst. So I had to start really being on top of the rent relief probably early August of 2021, but it still hasn't been the worst because I decided to be on top of it and not like turn my eye <laughs> and just ignore it, tried to get ahead of the problem. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I think one thing you mentioned there was just like helping people with like the assistance and different things. I mean, some people just have the mentality of like, oh, you're a tenant. It's up to you to do these things. But I mean, it's in your best interest to help them, you know, if they don't know that this stuff is even out there or if they don't, maybe they're, I don't know, they're ashamed. They feel like they don't even know how to fill it out or certain things. But I mean, it's in both of your best interests if you help them. So I think it's good that you did that. Yes. And I agree. And I think that's what I try to tell people online as well. It is in both of our interests to get this done. Now, if you don't get it done, you will be evicted. And I think that was something that doesn't always come across. This is still a business, guys. So I'm here to help. But when I tell you to show up, when we agree on a time frame, like I need you to show up, you know, because <laughs> We both need this to get done. Yeah. So it's not that I'm going to chase you around. And I don't want people, I guess I'm trying to say that because I don't want people to think we're babying or we are coddling. It's like, no, it's an appointment to fill out an application to submit. And if they don't come or don't come prepared, then other actions will be taken. But no one's expecting you as a landlord to show up at midnight because that's when they get off and to help them get ready to take the pick. You know, no one's expecting all that. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It helps both parties. So why not get ahead of it? Definitely, definitely. Um, did you have any instances with tenants where this process just didn't go well um, as far as helping them with the rent relief and fortunately had to part ways? Uh, I haven't yet. Well, I did have one actually. The one I said didn't pay in May. Um, she said she wanted to move out. She didn't move out because I was willing to take that loss and just write it off. Um, and then she, another month when I tried to get her to fill out the rent relief and she just wouldn't. So uh, I had to file for eviction and it sucked. Like it really sucked. And it sucked because it was avoidable. Mm -hmm. It was a hundred percent avoidable. For three months, I asked if she would fill out the rent relief because I can't fill it out by myself because they don't want landlords just saying, oh, well, no one paid. So give me all the money and not telling tenants. And then the tenant's name can't get more help later. Mm -hmm. and, and she was upset. She's like, my son, where's he going to go? Where's he going to go to school? And I'm like, this was avoidable. Right. This, this, all I needed was this one piece, but for three months you've ducked me. So here we are. And that sucks. But other than that, no, like, um, I am interested to know if some of these applications will go through because that's another piece that is a little tough. If I can't, I can submit what they want, but I don't decide if you get approved or not, right? Right. So if 
the state comes back because I, like I said, it was two months from application to check. If the state comes back and says, no, <laughs> we will not give this person relief. I'm looking at this person like, so what's next? <laughs> because you haven't paid rent in two months. Now we're on month three. And if you truly could not have paid before, definitely can't pay with the three month backlog. So like, what do we do? So, right. yeah, I haven't had issues yet, but I'm also prepared for it. Of like, okay, well, what are those next steps? And what do I have to do? What else can I do? Right, right, definitely. Definitely. Uh, so since the last time we had you on the show, you've pretty much more than doubled your units. So now you're at yeah. 30, 30, right? Mm -hmm. And at that time, I believe you're at 14. Um, so can you talk to us about just that growth and, and what that looked like? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, when we first talked six months prior, I had bought my first commercial property. So this 10 unit apartment building, all studios, uh, renovated or converted motel. And I was excited. I bought it really, really cheap. And the whole point was to practice. And that might sound weird, but I, I didn't know how to manage a building that large, right? And it was cheap and it didn't make me very much, but it also, because it was so cheap, if I messed up or if tenants didn't pay, I wasn't drowning. So my first commercial property cost me 160,000. Like that's less than what I paid for the house I live in versus other properties that I could have gotten for 400 or $500,000, but would have truly bankrupt me if I would have had those same issues. Um, like I mentioned to you guys, that lady didn't pay for three and a half months, but her rent, because she came with the building I bought, her rent was 275. So she didn't pay for three months, but I, I lost like $1,000 over everything versus some of my tenants pay, you know, if I, if I have a tenant paying $1,500 a month, mm -hmm. I could have lost 5,000 in that same time. And if my job had stopped working for some reason, there's just so much risk. So I bought a small apartment building to try it out and learn the system and was able to feel comfortable with my system. So I decided to buy another and the property next door was for sale and actually put an offer in right during the pandemic. So I think March, 2020 pandemic, I put an offer April or May of 2020 and he accepted it. Then we did the inspection and I had to change the offer because it needed way more work than I thought. And he denied it. He said, no, I won't give you, I asked for a lot more credits. He said, no, I won't give you that. And come November, he was like, hey, so like about that offer. <laughs> <laughs> Because he thought he could get more for it. So staying prepared and stacking my money and saving, and I'm not going to lie, not having to pay student loans definitely helped, right? Putting money aside just in case an investment popped up. And it did. And so I bought another apartment building in January, or I guess December, January. Um, and I've been getting that together. So now I have a little complex I work with. And already my family's like, do you want to buy the third? And I was like, no, stop trying <laughs> to get me to do more work. But that's how uh, the numbers doubled. I bought a second building. Are you looking for a community of like-minded individuals and access to experts in real estate? Yeah. Are you interested in real estate but need more support and guidance? You know who it is. The Black Real Estate Dialogue presents the Real Estate Investing Community. Uh -huh. How much or how little real estate experience you have, we've created a community for you because your perspective is important. All right, tell me, where's the number one place where you can do Q&A with experienced guest speakers two times per month? How about unlimited access to past guest speakers recordings? What, what, what about a private Slack channel to engage in daily discussion with everybody in the community to share resources and support each other? Head on over to BlackRealEstateDialogue.com. That's BlackRealEstateDialogue.com. It's the real estate investing community presented by the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Come join us today. Join us today. Join us today. Definitely. So that that uh second um, building is like 12, 14 units or something? That one is uh 12 units. 12. Yes. Okay, cool, cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Um, so you mentioned the first um building you bought was practice and you kind of learned your systems. Um, what are some things you learned um during that process that helped you 
when you expand it even more? Absolutely. I learned you need a system. That's what I learned for sure. I had four townhomes up until that point and single family, you know, like they pretty much just, and the, and the apartments or the townhomes were in great condition when I bought them, right? Moving ready, no issues to fix. So it was really easy for them to move in and me not to get any phone calls. And I knew I needed practice because I knew that wasn't real. Like I knew it wasn't going to be, oh, you just never get phone calls. And once a year you say, do you want to renew? And everyone's like, absolutely. I want to renew. And there's no showings. Like for two years, real estate was really easy. And I knew not to get fall into that trap of, well, (laughs) this is so simple. Why doesn't everybody do this all the time? And I bought this cheap property for practice, right? I loved the building because it was small. It was brick. It was one level. So I'm talking no stairs, no outside lights that I'm paying for, no uh, shoveling sidewalks, easy lawn maintenance. Like everything was simple. So if I couldn't handle this on my own, I had no hope of handling something bigger. I definitely would have to hire property management to help me out. So I learned I needed a system. And that system needed to include communication. So how are tenants going to communicate with you if there's an issue? And when are you going to respond, right? Because it's not okay to wait a week, but you don't have to pick up in the first five minutes, right? And I'm sharing this because I know some of you might consider doing this with your regular job, but I'm not saying like I have uh, currently put my work phone on airplane mode because they can last the length of this interview without calling me (laughs) because it's okay because there are no emergencies that I can fix in the next two minutes anyway. So how are they going to communicate with you for issues? And how are you going to communicate with them? If you have to reach them, the second was maintenance. So when I talk about maintenance, I'm talking about, there's two kind of maintenance things you have to do. There's regular work. So there's mowing the lawn there's cleaning up trash, there is um, sweeping outside, there is like we're putting in a laundromat, there's going to be like cleaning out the filters. Those are normal things that need to be done on a regular basis. And then there's maintenance requests of my toilet's leaking, this is broken, X, Y, and Z. So having a system of when those things get done. And that helped me stay sane and also gave the tenants a peace of mind right? If a light bulb blew, it will not get fixed till Monday. That's the day we do not emergency stuff. So you're just going to have to, if there is a slight leak under your sink, put a bucket and I will be there on Monday. Because if I'm rushing to you every time, your rent will have to go up. Like that, that level of attention is not being paid for currently. So that's part of that process. So I said communication, I said maintenance, and then, well, those probably the two big ones. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, and then I needed to practice or really learn the eviction process. That was something that I hadn't experienced before. Um, I had, like, I have very few units, but again, I had a lot of tenants on Section 8, so rent wasn't really a problem. Um, and in that original town I invested in, housing is scarce. So I think people were not trying to, like, mess that up. Yeah. versus this place is not that same issue. So learning what that process is in case I did need to evict. And if I messed up, again, the rents were so cheap when I first bought the place that if I had to wait another month, it wasn't going to make or break me. Definitely. I like that. Very, very strategic. One thing that that made me think about is as someone who is, I'm sure you've spoken to countless new landlords people, new landlords are probably listening to this interview. Absolutely. People really want to provide good customer service. In your opinion, how do you balance providing good customer service with like overextending yourself and being so responsive that it sets an unrealistic expectation whenever there's an issue? How do you find that balance? Yeah, I think it's being very, very clear with yourself what you're willing to offer and then being very clear about those offerings to your tenant right? Um, 
If you can't pick up the phone, then we communicate through text. Like that's how we communicate. If that's what it is. I, my property is almost two hours away from my home. So they know this is not going, I, I can't fix everything right away. So how do we balance something is broken versus I, I need you to fix something. Number one, we learn what an emergency versus a non-emergency is. And an emergency will be handled by a professional immediately. But an emergency, there are very few emergencies. And I, and I need, and that was made clear at every signing. There are very few true emergencies, period. <laughs> um, so fire, right? I can't help anyway. So <laughs> you should call the fire department. So let me fix that actually. There are very few true emergencies that can be solved by me, that can be solved by me. Right. Fire, robbery, all that. That's not me. That's not my job. You need to call the fire department. You need to call the police department. The second, in my case, has been finding properties that are easy to take care of, right? And I'm not looking for properties with HVAC units. And I'm not looking for properties with three levels and attics and a little corner and, and crawl spaces. I'm not looking for properties with potential issues. I want boxes and I want them to be very simple because the tenant knows where everything is and how to fix it. And there's very little to break. And I jump to the third one, which is customer service. Part of it is teaching the customer how to service themselves <laughs> is, hey, this is how you shut off water in your apartment. So if you see water somewhere you shouldn't see water, you each have your own hookup, shut off the water so that your apartment's not flooded. This is where your breaker box is. And this is where the, what this is what this means. So if all of a sudden your, your microwave like clicked off and you heard a click sound, go to your breaker box, check to see if the breaker is working. I had a lady call me, she said, my fridge died. And I said, fridges don't die. That's not what happens. You don't just like open the fridge one day and it just doesn't turn off. That, that doesn't, it was probably dying. So I asked, was it an issue before? She's like, not before today. And I was like, ma'am, I need you to check the breaker. And she was like, it's not the breaker. And I was like, ma'am, I... I, like check the breaker and she was like it's not the breaker and I was like okay well that is an emergency but it's Friday at 8 p.m so keep your fridge closed and I will see you tomorrow Saturday not my usual work day but this is an emergency and I will see you tomorrow with a new fridge and she called back at midnight and she's like it was a breaker and I was like I knew it was I knew it was <laughs> it was the breaker and there was a whole other issue with that but when they, when you learn your own property, right? Everyone gets a plunger. Someone had called me and it happened once. Someone had called me and said, my toilet is plugged. My toilet is clogged. And I was like, did you just use the bathroom? And they said, yes. And I was <laughs> like, well, sounds like you need to get your toilet unclogged, sir. Because it'd be, and this will be different. People listening. If we had a backup from the septic, mm -hmm. right? This will be different. If multiple people were calling me and saying they were seeing backup, because maybe a root has gone into the main pipe. Maybe the septic tank is full. Now that is my problem. But if you just had Chipotle and went to the bathroom, that is not my responsibility. I'm going to need you to like, and I'm not calling a plumber. I'm going to need you to like figure out how to unclog your toilet. Um, but everyone gets a plumber. i uh, sorry. gets a plunger. But those things minimize the calls. Mm -hmm. Right. So it is really going back quick review, defining what works for you. What are you willing to do? Being very clear with the tenants about that, then helping them understand how they can help themselves and sticking true to those boundaries. If you can do that, you will have great customer service because customer service doesn't mean you just give them everything they want or give people anything they want at any time. It's I'm giving you the service that I promised you when we signed this lease. Definitely. Definitely. That's that. Hey, that's, that's a lesson on, on, on boundaries. Uh, so thank you. Appreciate you breaking that down. Um, and uh, something else that you've uh, gotten into is uh, flipping. Um, so I know yes. uh, you're in the process of your first flip. So can you talk to us more about um, why you decided to go in that route, how you were able to, um, you know, raise the capital and so forth. And just also how, how it's going. Yeah. So I started considering flipping because I have great money coming in for my long-term rentals, but there's a lot of debt associated with rentals. Like I'm not buying in cash. Um, I'm not over leveraged, but I also have like a million dollars in real estate debt. And 
I don't want to have that much debt, but the, the real estate debt is okay because it's paying for itself. But I have student loan debt. I had car debt. My husband had car debt, student loan debt. And I didn't want to raise a family with personal debt. I wanted to say the, other than my mortgage, I was willing to have a, a house mortgage, but I didn't, I want to be able to invest in my kids as much as my parents invested in me, but we couldn't do that if we were paying two car notes and two sets of student loans. And if I were to pay it off extra, it would still take a long time, right? But flipping was a model of like, oh, well, I can get an, an extra $20,000 where if I paid an extra thousand of loan, that would take almost two years to get to that same place. And a flip can be done start to finish in six to eight months, right? With everything included. So I started flipping and I had a mentor in Chicago who flipped out there and my area was becoming too expensive. Um, where I currently, when I bought my first townhouse, it was $85,000, a house on that same street, the same, a same house that is in worse condition than mine is currently on the market for 195. So within six years, wow. Right. And I don't, I've been across the sales. I'm like, you, <laughs> I hope it goes, but my mind can't even wrap. I can't even wrap my head around that. Yeah. That a property I paid 85,000 for the same structure in worse shape is going for 195. But that's why I couldn't flip where I was. And because I had a mentor in Chicago, I felt like that was a safer place to try. And um, I'm gonna, not gonna lie. Don't love it. Don't love flipping. And I don't love it because I feel very out of control. I love being in control, but that is okay because that's part of learning and growing. Um, that there are gonna be things that you're uncomfortable with. Maybe it's living with someone in terms of house hacking. Maybe it's moving to another state or city because your current state or city is too expensive. Maybe it's investing out of state because you know, again, your current area is too expensive. Maybe it's doing short-term rentals with Airbnb or a VRBO or, or, or travel nurses instead of the long-term rentals, but you gotta furnish it. So yeah, it got done. It's on the market. Second property is in the works and is, is moving. And I, I think the biggest lesson I've taken is that with what I learned from the first flip was that no one is going really, truly in my spirit learning, no one is going to love your stuff as much as you do. And you either have to let that feeling go or be more involved. I was essentially hands off for the entire process and I went to go see it for the first time and it was like done, but I didn't adore everything that was chosen or all the colors or all the tile. And it's like, Hey, again, remember guys, I talked about practicing with that first property. This was practice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think when we hear practice, you think it's going to be great every time. And it's not, if I'm anything of all my platforms, I'm very honest yep. and it wasn't great. Now, Will it sell? Yes. But could it have been better? Yes. And so now I know that I need to be in Chicago more frequently. So if I just have a standing once a month trip, that's what it is until my market cools off a little bit and I can do more stuff here when I can just jump in the car and be there and back in a day. So yeah. And I funded it. The question you asked was with people online. I want to I do not, how do I want to say it? I want to make sure I'm saying it right. There is a lot wrong with America's housing situation and with America's finances. And I do not have the strength or the knowledge to change those institutions or the care, to be quite mm -hmm. honest. I'm not trying to go up against them. But what I do have the strength or the hope to do is create new institutions. Um, and this again, practice was like a micro investing group of, Hey, you guys loan me money. I will give it back to you. They're like, you guys become private lenders to me, but like micro lenders, you don't need to yeah. loan me 50,000 to make it work. You guys become micro lenders to me. I go out and flip and I then give the profits back to you. So you will get a 20% return on your investment in a year. And this is what I'm doing. I'm sharing it with you too for people who want to learn and maybe do it themselves. 
but that's how I raised it. And how is it practice? It's practice because if it didn't sell, if something went wrong and it was terrible, I had the cash to pay these people out myself. So it was more, I'm trying to learn the process. What do I need to do with the lawyer? What do I need to register with securities? What do I need to uh, give every month? How do we file taxes on this money? This is what I had to learn with a very small pocket with a very small like check and change before we can get bigger and do more because you don't want your first time to be like, oh, this was the million dollars and I didn't buy anything to flip and I don't have it. And what do I do? Yeah. It's not that situation. Yeah. And like you mentioned similar things a couple of times. So the first large complex was for practice. This first flip is for practice. And what I don't want people to lose is that you don't have to go for the huge move right away. And there's value yeah. in starting with what you have, building up your skill level and gradually increasing it, yes. you know? Um, yes. The second flip, I'm sure it will go way better than the first and so on. Maybe you'll get to a point where you can do multiple at one time, but the experience you're getting with the first one, the experience you got with the first large complex, it's it helped you it's, and it's going to help you going forward. So I really want people to, to recognize that. Yeah, and that practice doesn't mean success. I am not trying to be successful, I'm practicing. And sometimes the practice will tell you this is not it. And that's okay too. Sometimes the practice will say, hey, I don't like this <laughs> and I don't wanna do this. My husband was a house hacker and we house hacked a cheap property that we lived in. My husband's not a house hacker, he's not. He practiced for a year because we paid off our loan, or sorry, our wedding but he doesn't want to, he's not built for it. He doesn't like it. He wants to have his own space. And is that costing us money? Absolutely, but that's okay because he's not built for it. I am not, um, there are jobs I'm not built for, right? You try them for a little while and it doesn't work out and that is okay as well. So everything Sam said, but adding this is so you can learn not necessarily so you can succeed immediately. Definitely. So. Um... One lesson you mentioned that you learned is that people won't love your stuff as much as, as you do. Is there another lesson or two that you learned during this first flip that you want to take into the next one? Yeah. Um, I think something for me was if something feels wrong, address it immediately. Um, I don't know necessarily the demographics of the, your listeners, but I know for mine, I have a lot of younger, when I say younger, I mean like under 40 audience members, viewers, and a lot of women. And sometimes it could be really hard to say I'm unhappy to someone who is older, to someone who is maybe male, to someone who is the professional mm -hmm. to say I'm unhappy or I'm confused. Will you explain this to me? or will we change this? Right. And for some people, it's their first time being the boss and actively saying like, hey, I don't like this, or I don't understand why this is the choice, or I'm disappointed in what's happening. That was difficult for me because they were far away. They were the professionals. Maybe it's different there, who knows? But once I got comfortable saying that, things sped up and things changed. And if anything, I felt more like, I am in control of this, even if it crashes and burns versus something crashing and burning, knowing I should have told the person to turn left. But I was like, well, they, they know best. So we've been going down this wrong road for a long time. And I knew it was the wrong road or I sensed something was off, but I didn't want to embarrass them. I didn't want to embarrass myself. I didn't want, I had lost sight maybe for a while of like that we're practicing and this comes to be a part of it. So that was it. And with the love, I think it's really just, I hope, let me clarify that. Let's think about people's kids, right? If I'm saying no one's going to love your kids as much as you do, I don't need to love your kids like a mom to teach them biology, right? Mm -hmm. It's not necessary <laughs> for me to love them this much as you do. So when I say no one's going to love it as much as you do, remember, people don't always need to, right? No one, like when they send you a package in the mail, they don't need to love on the package in order to get it to your front door. Now, they can't destroy it either. <laughs> I know yeah. that. Um, but there is a level of, I'm looking at my door right here, like when I look at the like paint lines, 
these people like loved their work when they painted this door. And if you can't, if you're just listening, I'm going to point to a door in my office. But when I went to that property, like some people didn't love their paint lines, you know, and being like, okay, so this is why you need to be present. Or this is why you can't go too long without being a part of a conversation or being a part of this. So those would probably be my two biggest of don't be afraid to take charge of your stuff. And people aren't going to necessarily love it as much as you do. So you have to check in. Definitely, definitely. Um, and something else that uh, you have ramped up since our last interview is coaching. So can you talk mm-hmm. more about um, your coaching, um, how that looks, who could be a good fit to work with you? Um, can you talk, talk some more about that? Absolutely. So I think there's kind of three levels of the way people work with me, right? The first level is just exposure. You are just seeing me on Instagram. You're seeing me on TikTok or Facebook or Twitter. And you are just that free content. You are just like, I'm getting information. I'm getting exposed to how she makes money, how money is made in real estate. What are the risks involved? And then the second level will be direct instruction. That's my membership. That is, hey, it's a small investment per month, but you get weekly Q&A uh, Zoom brunches. You get opportunities to speak with me one-on-one on the phone. Like I could focus just on you. You get all of the content that has been posted for the last year and a half. All of that is available to you for monthly fee. And then the third phase is implementation. That's the people who are like, I got instructed. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know the the basics. I have a foundation. Now I'm ready to put it into practice. And that is one-on-one coaching through Zoom, where we are not just talking about what does house, what is house hacking? We're saying what is house hacking for Sam in LA with whoever he wants, with with whatever, right? It's very specific because we're talking about how do we get you to do the thing in 2021 based on your goals, not what is it? So those would be the three levels, exposure, who are you, what do you do, instruction, I want to build a foundation that I can grow upon, and third, implementation, I am ready to put it into practice. Definitely, love it, love it. Um, what, is, what does the future look like? Do you want to add more doors? Do you want to focus more on the flipping, coaching, or something completely different? What are, what are some thoughts on what you have going on, or what you want to uh, do in the future? Definitely not more doors. Oh my God, no. (laughs) It's, um, we just had this conversation with my membership about why I wouldn't have more doors. And it's because when I first started and I was house hacking, I thought house hacking was it. It was like the pinnacle of genius. And that was partly because that was all I was exposed to, but it was also because that's all I had the money for. So of course that was the best option. And then I got into commercial investing because I had more money. So I was able to buy property. So instead of making $500 a month, I can make $5,000 a month per building. And then that seems like the pinnacle of everything. This is great. This is perfect. Now I've been introduced to flipping and flipping is like, Hey, you can make $20,000 in six months, but you're never going to get a phone call that like a toilet is clogged or I have roaches or I don't like the way so-and-so talked to me. So if you get two flips in a year and I can make the same profit with none of the stress, then why would I buy more doors? And I'm sure in the future, and, and, and I've already been exposed this year, if I do get more doors to commercial, to like, I'm in an office space right now. I rent this office space. There are 20 other offices on this floor and there's two bathrooms, no showers, no stove, no fridge. So think of how little maintenance is required from the people who own these kind of office spaces or the restaurants or the dentist, not, not the restaurant business, the, the floor that the restaurant is sitting on. You don't get phone calls because that's not your job. My job is just to keep the space open. <laughs> so there's just, I've been exposed to ways to make money in real estate that are cheaper and less work than continuing to buy rentals that people live in. So I'm going to probably leave this to the young folk and let them get in and (laughs) do that work. 
and find something that might not profit as much, but takes, gives me back my time. Cause I did this for time, not necessarily for large amounts of money. Definitely. Definitely. That makes sense. Do you ever foresee yourself um, using a property manager in the future? I know, you know, currently you're pretty much managing all the units yourself. Um, has that, is that something that you've thought about? It has. I, I think what has been difficult is for me is pricing. Yeah. Um, my townhomes really simple, really simple to fit into the normal institution of property management. Mm -hmm. My complex, not so much. Like I don't think it fits into that easy ten percent because it it needs more attention because there are more people. And this goes back to that practice accepting the reality of this needs more attention. It makes way more money, but you it's not a hands off situation. So do I need someone there more frequently? Is it better to hire someone? Like that's not necessarily a legal property manager, mm -hmm. but is my 20 hour week employee that sits in the office and does those things? Or is it better to sell? I don't know. So I, I'm really considering it. I just don't know if the property that does need the manager, if that fits yet into the institution as is, or if I have to be more creative. Got it. That makes sense. So if I understand correctly, um, it's a lot more complex when you get to that level. You might need somebody at least part-time and paying them probably more than you'd pay property manager. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you'd have to factor in the cost and if it would still be profitable enough for you and stuff like that, right? Yeah. If it's then becomes like, okay, well, is this is worth it for me? Cause all the money's coming to me. There's no middle yeah. person, but is it worth it? Once I have to give that middle person a cut, is this even worth it anymore? Or should I take the income when I sell it and do something simpler? Right. Cause once people get the offices, that's it. Like there's not, I, again, I, I know people just listen to it cause it's podcast, but there ain't nothing in here to break. It's just, just a square room. <laughs> <laughs> so my landlord will probably not hear from me until it's time to renew next year because there's nothing that they're responsible for. So as long as the electricity and the internet stay on, it's easy to manage out of state or it's easy to manage somewhere else because very little can go wrong versus appliances, fridges, heating, cooling, insects, birds. Like there's so much more that can go wrong. Right. I mean, I appreciate the transparency um, because, you know, just to know in the self-awareness really, so just to know that as far as the number of doors, this is probably it for you with like the residential side. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that transparency. And I think it's something for people to think about as they grow their portfolios. Like you have to know what your level is. Everyone doesn't want to have a thousand units, you know, everyone doesn't, we had a guest recently, he was like, you know, the number of doors is great, but it's about the profitability too, because there could be someone with two, 300 doors. And if you factor in everything, they profit like a hundred bucks a door. Whereas someone with a fraction of that, they might already have reached their income goal for rental units. So it's just something for people to think about, you know, you have to run your own race. You have to, you know, a lot of us get shiny object syndrome. We see yes. someone with, and we've had guests with a range of doors, people with three units and people with hundreds, you know? I think the important thing is just for people to be self-aware, run their own race. Like you don't have to want what somebody else has, you know? Yes. We're all individuals. Everyone's path is different. Um, just because you stop at a certain number of units and do something else does not mean you're a failure. You just decide to do yeah. something else, you know? Yeah. So I appreciate That's that. That's absolutely right. That's, uh, it is highly personal. and. I can already tell if somebody is trying to chase somebody else's dream when they, even when they tell me doors, because doors has nothing to do with money. Just right. like you said, it has not a thing to do with money. And I always tell people if I would, what about if I gave you one door that made $20,000 a month, would you take it? Or do you have to have the 200, right? Cause I, there is, I just found out um, one of the bars that's near my university's like bar street, mm -hmm. it's for sale. And they were like, oh yeah, the lease is 25,000 a month for rent. And it's like, yeah, I forget that people pay these kinds of rents, that that is not unheard of. Now, somebody bought this building 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and was able to hold on to it because there's no note attached to it. But 
if I offered you one bar where they had to take care of everything themselves for 25 grand, would you say yes? And if the answer is yes, then it's like, you don't care about doors and that's okay. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I care about how much money it's making me. And if it's one door can do that, dope. If not, I will buy more until I get there, but you are absolutely correct. Definitely, definitely. Um, this has been a dope interview. I think it's really cool for um, the listeners just to hear how, how far you've come in, a, in just under two years. And again, I highly encourage anyone who has not listened to episode 14 to check it out because yes, the growth please. is just incredible. Um, Even the very... growth with the quality of my microphone, you know, it's yeah. gotten better. I'm sure this is going to sound so much better than episode 14. Oh yeah. So. I, I think I th I'm sure, I'm sure I sound way better too. <laughs> got 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 you know, to upgrade in equipment, lights, and stuff like that. So right. you know, you'll you'll be able to see growth in a lot of ways if you check that out. <laughs> um, is there anything you want to leave with the listeners? And of course, um, let let them know how they can reach you, how they can tap into everything you have going on. Yeah, I just my husband likes to make fun of me, but. I think that I'm a very optimistic realist, but I don't want people to skip over the realness of what we do. We are investors who invest in housing, which is a human need in order to survive. And it can be very profitable, but there are still people on the other side of the table. And so when we have these discussions, it's really about how do you humanely do what we do? How do you ethically do what we do? Why do you need to have boundaries? Why do you need to have these systems? And it is because it is not just, there is something on the other end that we have to pay attention to. I am a huge proponent of investing. I am a huge proponent of thinking towards the future because if you were like me, the idea of being to working till 70 was just out of the question. It just wasn't real. But also understanding that as much as we all want to retire and that we all want to have something else pay for our lifestyles, there's work that needs to be done. Very real work from budgeting, to purchasing, to credit work. And you have me, you have everyone else that Sam has interviewed to help you with those things, but it's going to take time. Very few people are ready by accident to buy property. So that's what I have to leave with. Uh, you can find me on social media, either with my name, Deandra McDonald, or Simple Real Estate. Both of those things will pop me up. Um, I mostly post on Instagram and TikTok. Those are probably my most posted sites, but I also post sometimes on Facebook and occasionally on Twitter. So if you want to join me there, you can do it there too. Cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, coming on the show. Definitely appreciate you coming back, sharing your story and updates and look forward to having you on again um, sometime in the future to see what you have going on as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for having me on again, Sam. Of course, of course. And thank you again to everyone for listening to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. If you have not already, please subscribe, leave us a five-star rating and review. That'll help us expand this message and reach as many people as we can and move up in the rankings. So thank you so much for your support. And also, if you want to join the Bread Real Estate Investing Community, you can get started for just $1. Go to blackrealestatedialogue.com for more information or you can simply click the link below in the show notes. Thank you all again. I look forward to hearing from you all soon. Hi everyone, Sam here from Black Real Estate Dialogue. Make sure to hit that notification bell and that subscribe button and to visit us at blackrealestatedialogue.com.